happen no matter how prepared I am. Anything, there's a chance that anything can still happen. And I just, I just use that as, as motivation and try to embrace those feelings, honestly. This is my conversation with UFC lightweight contender and philanthropist Dustin Poirier. It happened during his training camp for his fight for the UFC's BMF belt with Justin Gaethje. Dustin is a true fighter's fighter, an absolute savage in the cage who brings the violence every time and who's turned things around in his career countless times, both inside the cage in tough moments and tough fights, but also between fights after facing a crushing loss. But at the same time, he's the opposite of what you think a meathead fighter is. He's humble and respectful of his opponents, a true family man, and he's dedicated a ton of time with his wife to building a nonprofit called the Good Fight Foundation, which serves underprivileged communities in Louisiana. He's also used philosophy and mindset work to become a better fighter in person, and that's something we discuss here. In this conversation, we talk about overcoming adversity, training for resilience, using fear as fuel for performance, and how stoicism helped him overcome negative emotions and reach a new level of toughness. We also poke a bit of fun at some of his past opponents and talk about his upcoming fights and challenges. I hope you all enjoy this. This is Dustin the Diamond Poirier. So Dustin, th thank you so much for doing this. Um, I've been following your journey for a long time. I mean, like way back from the great uh, fight Phil documentary days. No, it's crazy to think. Uh, I was just talking yesterday. I just got back to South Florida to start my training camp, and I was in the sauna after training yesterday, and there was a young, younger fighter in there, and they started talking about the fight Phil documentary. And I just sitting back like, I think that documentary was released in 2011. It's crazy to think that 12 years has gone by since then, man. Time's flying. It's crazy. I remember watching it and saying like, wow, this guy, Dustin Poirier, he seems awesome. Like, but is he like really a legit fighter? Like, is he really going to make it? You know, I remember like Still watching standing, it. Still standing, man. Yeah. Still standing. Love that. Super cool. And, and along your journey, obviously, I remember like the, the big memorable moments, like your gut-wrenching loss to Connor in 2014, you know, a fight that in many ways made him. I mean, you were the first really legit top 10 guy that he faced. And then after that, you just bouncing back, going up a weight class, which was super surprising at the time, and just rewriting your story from there. So becoming interim champ in 2019, beating pound for pound king at the time, Max Holloway, becoming number one contender, fight of the night, performance of the night, I don't even know how many times, and then facing Connor again, not once, but twice, the biggest star in the game, and defeating him decisively both times. I mean, really, as a UFC fighter, you're known in the industry as a true sportsman, respectful to a fault, a fighter who brings the warrior spirit, but also a humble and very relatable approach to the game. So Dustin Poirier, thank you so much for doing this. It's a real honor to have you here with me today. I appreciate that, man. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. So I'd like to start with the question of violence, because despite its popularity, MMA still has a lot of detractors out there in society, people who say it condones violence and like fighting as a way to resolve disputes. You're in many ways the opposite of the stereotype that people think of when they think of like a meathead fighter. You're super soft-spoken, you're humble, uh, you're a family man. I was talking to your manager, Ben, and saying how much of a, of a, of a girl dad you are. Um, you're a super active member of your community. You're involved in philanthropy, which I want to get to um, a little bit later. At the same time, like real UFC fans know that you can bring the pain and the violence when needed even more than the vast majority of professional fighters, which is saying a lot. I'm curious about how you frame the issue of violence in your life. How did you learn to sort of channel and control it growing up? And how do you make sure it doesn't come out at the wrong time, like, like sometimes happens with a lot of other fighters? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, when I was younger, I used to get in a lot of fights, get in a lot of scuffles. And then uh, when I was like 17 years old, I found boxing and started wanting to, to box kind of putting my energy and focus into that. But I mean, violence is, it's part of human nature, you know, aggression and fighting is, is, is in our blood. Um, that's why I feel like, you know, in schools, when there was a, in middle schools, when two kids got into it, there's a crowd surrounding them running around. It's just our instinct to, to run there, you know, uh, and, and it's, it's, it's in our blood and, uh, to, to get to use that and develop it over the years and, 
focus on combat sports and put all my energy into that really helped me found like my footing and my way in life. You know, it's provided a beautiful life for me and my family at this point. Um, you know, at, at the beginning, it was just something I loved to do. I wasn't paying the bills. It was a hobby that I was just fell in love with, you know, competing as an amateur, learning, getting pushed in the gym, the camaraderie between my friends in the gym and coaches. It was just a place that I enjoyed. It was a safe place for me to, to work and let out frustrations and aggression and focus on something as a young guy. And it just turned into this career for me, man. And, and it's, it's mm -hmm. been incredible. What a, what a journey. It's interesting how you put it that uh, fighting is like natural in human nature. When you see like all the the, the anti bullying movement today in the schools, where they try to sort of eliminate all all traces of violence, and you know the kids maybe like don't grow up learning how to defend themselves as much as like a previous generation. Do you think that that's like maybe maybe there's a better approach? Maybe it's better to learn how to actually defend yourself and control it because there may come points in time where you have a bully that actually shows up, or you have an injustice, and it's kind of important to know how to stand up for yourself. Yeah, I think everybody should, you know, especially children, man, not just for the self-defense um, things that something like jujitsu would, would give you. Just the uh, testing yourself and, and learning about yourself through the martial arts is a great thing that I found later in life. I wish I was in it at an earlier age, but I, I think it's great for anybody. Not Like I said, not just for self-defense. That's great. You do need to know how to defend yourself and carry yourself around people, especially in those kind of positions if you're being bullied and things like that. But just to uplift who you are and to learn about yourself through martial arts is a great way to do it. Mm. Cool. You've shared the octagon with literally some of the toughest fighters on the planet. You fought for probably uh, some of the toughest divisions the UFC has ever had over the last 10 years, right? The divisions you actually fight in, even inside the UFC, are known as being the toughest. I mean, a real shark tank of fighters. And I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that most ordinary people would crack under that, that kind of pressure. How do you manage the nerves and the emotions that come before a big fight when you know you're going to face probably a lot of adversity? How do you transform that nervous energy into fuel for your performances? I, at the beginning of my career, I was very uncomfortable with those, you know, with those feelings of, of the nerves, the butterflies, the uncertainty of what I'm about to walk into. But that's mm -hmm. what fighting is, you know, over the over the years and just learning about fighting and learning about myself through failures and through victories. Um, it's just part of the journey when you do this. I don't think those feelings ever go away. If they do, you're, you need to stop. You know, I, I want to I use that to, to as momentum to carry me through when I'm in the locker room and I'm a nervous wreck because I'm what we do. The whole world is watching and we're going to try to hurt each other. That's the name of the game. Um, and, and out there, no matter how prepared you are, I had a great, you know, I can have a great nine week training camp, feel the best I've ever felt, but I'm still walking. When I walk through that arena and, and step out in there and walk to that octagon, it's the theater of the unknown. No matter how prepared I am, anything, there's a chance that anything can still happen. And I just, I just use that as, as motivation and try to embrace those feelings. Honestly, you know, they, they're still there very much, but I'm just more familiar with them. And I know they're coming here here in a few weeks. You know, I'll be in the same position I've been in. Yeah. Time and time again in the locker room, warming up, hearing the crowd roar, know my time's coming, looking up at the clock, you know, uh, just waiting for it to happen. I just have to deal with those. Don't let them control me. I use them uh, to push me. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like in your career, uh, uh, something switched at some point. I mean, early in your career, you used to sometimes fight angry or take things a little bit more personally. But at some point, you seem to switch your mindset and started saying things along the lines of, you know, it's not about the person, it's about their style. Or, you know, the second time you fought Connor, uh, you were just way cooler about it. You were, you didn't have this kind of emotional approach. You know, he talked trash and you'd be like, yeah, it's cool, whatever, it's just business. And I'm also thinking after your, your fight with Michael Chandler, where he pulled some dirty tactics in the middle of the fight, you were just like, you just talked about like not panicking, like only controlling what I can control, something you just said right now as well. Have you done any kind of like mental work to kind of change your mindset, to kind of move on from like sort of taking things more personally, more emotionally, and becoming almost like more stoic and clear headed about, about the whole thing and the whole challenge? And do, do you feel that doing this helped you achieve even a higher level of toughness in a way. Yeah, just, it just, I definitely did exactly what you're saying. I, um, it, to me, fighting is still, I mean, it's a one-on-one -on -one competition with the world watching. Like I said before, we're going to try to hurt each other. So it is very personal. I know what you're going to try to do to me and I'm going to try to do the same thing to you. So there is a, a personal uh, aspect of what we're going to do. We're going to try to hurt each other and take 
the win from each other and, uh, you know, try to beat each other's will and and break each other mentally and physically. So it is very personal. But to detach myself from that in these competitions now is something I have been working on. Yeah. Over the, probably over the last six years, I've been doing some practices I learned through a mental coach and um, just trying to remove the, 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 the negativity, the thoughts, the voices, the outside of the circle. Like I always say, I draw the circle and what on the inside I can control. I just mm -hmm. focus on that, man. Everything else is noise. I, I know what mm -hmm. I need to do as long as I check the boxes that I need to check. What's going to happen is going to happen. You know, I do love uh, a lot of things from from stoicism. Yeah, because that, that that dichotomy of control, right? Like if I don't if I don't control it, it's completely on the outside. I don't I don't give it any energy. I don't give it any any sort of uh, momentum over over myself. And you just kind of really control what's inside inside the circle as much as you can. Right. And and into that uncomfortable, into that unsure walk that I'm going to make. That's, that's the obstacle is the way, you know, I need to, yes. that's the way I need to go. Mm, mm, love that. Love that. And, and do you also like play with like things like meditation or breath work, like any other practices that helped you along that challenge? Yeah, I do meditate. It's not a regular thing. Like I'm not doing it every day, but at least once a week when I have quiet time in the morning, I'll stretch before practice and kind of just get my mind, you know, file my, my thoughts in order before I go out and what I'm going to try to do in training, what are the goals, this, this training session, what do I'm, what am I looking for out of myself in the, in these, uh, performances when I'm training. And, and I try to just focus on that thing and, and keep it in my mind during training as well. Just try to slow my mind down because it's always running, man. I, I, it doesn't stop. I'm always, I have trouble sleeping at night. I'm, I can never turn it off. <laughs> Of course. I mean, mo most people like go away from the challenges. You not only go towards the challenges, you go towards the highest possible challenges in your, in your, in your, in your field. I mean, you're always fighting the toughest guys over and over again. I'm curious when, when you're in the dressing room right before a fight and you say like, even to this day, you're kind of like a nervous rag and there's, there's no way to, to eliminate the reality of what's about to happen. You're about to walk in there with another certified killer and you guys are going to try to do bad things to each other. That's just the reality of it. You have to sort of accept it. But do, do, you, do you do anything? Like, do you have any, like, um, uh, like mindset stuff or breathing stuff? Or, like, do, do you get into, like, incantations or anything like that? Like, the, those old school warrior uh, practices uh, right before you walk out. Is there anything you do to kind of get you in the, the right mind frame? No. It, it, actually, the night of the fight in the locker room, I warm up. You know, try to keep it fun with my team. Have a good time. Like, Keep it playful like we do in the gym. That makes me feel the most comfortable, even though what I'm about to walk out there and do is is uh, stressful. I try to keep that same feeling we have in the gym mm. so it crosses over to the performance because mm. that's when I when I'm having fun. That's when I perform my best. But like the breathing and the, and the meditation is definitely done fight week. You know, I'm spending a week or so in a city that I've never been most of these fights and I'm going to do these media things, going to a training session and I'm just at my Airbnb for a week with lots of downtime. So, you know, you can't let those, w when that downtime happens, that's when those thoughts can creep in and you can start overthinking stuff. That's when I really, really focus on my mindset. Uh, when it gets quiet, when I'm back at the hotel or my Airbnb fight week. Yeah. I ask these questions because I'm really interested in your mindset because you are sort of, I kind of follow the UFC a little bit and I see all mm -hmm. the different approaches. I'm kind of very interested in the different approaches and the mindset work. And when I see somebody able to reinvent themselves the way you have and, and kind of like reach higher levels. And, and you're one of those um, fighters who has figured out the ability to sort of turn things around. And, and I mean that not only during the fight, but also between fights. So after like an excruciating loss, let's say like that first loss to Connor or the loss to Khabib, you're like, you can tell that you're like devastated, right? You're, you're there and you're, you're clearly like, you've worked so hard towards this goal. But then after that, you seem to be able to turn it around and find a way to sort of come back to the best version of yourself for the next fight. You don't let it bring you down like a lot of guys. You see a lot of people like negative momentum. You don't seem to be, you, you seem to have figured out how to turn the adversity around into sort of like learning from it and, and reaching a higher level. I, I just want, is this something you train? Is this something that you're aware of? Or is it something that was just naturally you've always been like, like that? It's something I learned over the years of competing. Um, you know, I'd be lying if I didn't say that days after defeats like that, I don't have down days, you know, I, I definitely do. But I know what's always made me feel better is getting back in the gym, working on things like just submerging myself in work and drowning out everything. That's always made me feel better. So that's just what I've been doing my whole career. That's honestly that the Khabib loss was one of the toughest ones for me because obviously it's for the world championship and I lost. 
but I had hip surgery right after. So I had a, a long period of time where over eight weeks where I couldn't walk. I couldn't put any weight on my leg because I had hip surgery and I wasn't able to do what I normally do after, after losses, which is just jump in the gym, work two a days, drown out all the thoughts, all the noise, just try to get better. Uh, so that one was one, like that was a mental hurdle I had to get over uh, after that loss. Hmm. Yeah. And, and, and so I'm curious because I remember that fight very well. And a lot of people think that you've come the closest to beating Khabib. You had him in that guillotine that even he said was extremely deep. And then so a lot of people will say, oh, you know, like it's a technical thing. Like if you so I wonder, like when you go back to the gym after, is it really a technical thing? Or is it really like, look, man, it was just everything's going 100 miles an hour. The guy's an animal. It's like you're, the cardio is going all over the place. Is it really sometimes like like cleaning up the technique or is it just there's just a lot more going on than people realize? It's both of those for sure. Mm -hmm. You know, things are going a thousand miles an hour. You are sweaty. You are exhausted. You most of the time you're bleeding. You're in an uncomfortable position, but a small flaw in technique will stop something from being a, a submission that finishes a fight or be a submission that gets you put in a bad position, you know. Uh, but we do. We do go back to the gym and try to work on the things right after fights like that. Um, what could have I, I've done better to, to stop him from getting my back to, from, or finish the choke that I had on him? It's all in the details, man. Mm. And I wonder how much how much you guys can replicate that kind of adversity in the gym without sort of breaking down the body. Um, do no, you we, we break the body down. Uh, we break oh, yeah. the body down. Oh, yeah, we push hard, man. <laughs> we push hard. You must be pu pushing yourself pretty hard for this one, and I, I, I will get back to it. But you're also known as a fighter who has this sense of community and this sense of purpose. Your nonprofit, the Good Fight Foundation, does a tremendous amount of good uh, for underserved communities in Louisiana. It's crazy. I, I was reading in an article the other day Uh, the top 15 most uh, dangerous uh, cities in the United States, and three of those were in the state of Louisiana. It's, it's just crazy how much uh, poverty and, and, and violence um, still exists there to this day. So, and you often make a point to say that you know, you're, you're a fighter, but you're also fighting a, a bigger fight. You're, you're, all, you're grateful for the entire journey. So almost like a, like a spiritual side that we don't uh, often hear from, from a lot of fighters. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how helping others and developing this broader sense of purpose, this broader sense of community, Um, change your approach to, to life and maybe even to fighting in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Let me see how I can start off, start talking about that. The, the thing is, you know, I'm going to go in there and fight for me and my family, regardless. That's, that's first things first. I'm going in there to provide for me and my family, to take another step closer to that world championship, to an opportunity to make more money, to put myself in a better position. More people can see what I'm doing. You know, I have a bigger platform, but at the same time, There's a lot of people who don't have that chance to be in front of the masses and their voice isn't heard. And if I'm going to do all those things for my family, regardless, what's what's why not throw something else on my back and, and try to bring awareness to things going on in Louisiana or further than that? You know, we've done some great things in Uganda with Justin Wren and Fight for the Forgotten. Um, so it's expanded beyond Louisiana. But but I feel like that's my that's my duty to do that, you know, to, to be a voice for these people. If I have an opportunity, I'm just thankful. I, I realized the platform I had when me and my wife started the foundation and started building it up to what it is now and the momentum it's got and how it's, it's grown and, and just, it's incredible. I'm blown away by it and by the things we do every year, but I feel like it's my job. You know, I'm in a position where I understand that people do listen when I talk and I have huge platforms with these huge fights that I'm in. And, uh, I've seen it firsthand, the people benefit from, from what we're doing. So I just, it's something I have to do. It's amazing. Um, I, I know we're a little bit uh, tight on time because you've got a big training camp, obviously for, for the BMF belt. Um, but people who follow the UFC know, know there's, there's a sort of like a sports aspect. That's like really like, you know, there's like a regular professional sport. And then there's an entertainment aspect and, and it's hard sometimes to sort of uh, know exactly where the lines are between the two. The UFC's parent company recently bought the WWE. So a lot of people think it's going to keep going more on the entertainment side of things. You've been getting into comment, commenting, like media commentary lately a little bit, doing more stuff on the media side. And a lot of fans wonder, you know, when you hear all the trash talking and sometimes get super personal, you know, people don't know how much of it is fake, how much of it is real, right? I feel like a lot of fighters say, you know, business is business. It's just promo. But some of it seems pretty real sometimes, right? You see like what just happened with like Kobe and Masvidal or Connor and Khabib or even you and Connor uh, to some degree. 
right. without disclosing too much from behind the scenes, you can't tell me it doesn't get kind of real sometimes. It must. I think a lot of it, you know, with the more money coming into the sport and, and the, those entertainment type people who are making like headlines with everything they say, they're just going against the grain and causing a ruckus. You know, those people, the more money that comes into the sport, the more I think you're going to see of that. People trying to become stars by whatever way they can. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of it's fabricated, but there's, I would say more of it's real. More of it's, 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 it's really? rooted from something. Yeah, there's a few guys who, who a lot of it's fabricated. But like the me and Connor, that was real, you know, uh, mm. between us, for sure. It's so funny how he flipped because with the second fight, he was so respectful and he was so kind of like buddy, buddy with you and everything else. And then right. when you actually beat him, because it was like, like when he was alpha to you, it was like, hey, Dustin, like you're a nice guy. But then when you kind of flipped the alpha on him, he got very uncomfortable very fast. Is that kind of how you read the situation? For sure. And maybe that's something that he was, he thought he needed to fuel him and push him to compete better. You know, all, all these guys' mindsets are different. Maybe he thought that him being friendly in that second fight was a downfall for him. You know, mm. I, I don't know. I can't get into his head, but it's definitely a, was a different person each time. It's like he couldn't phase you anymore. You know, the first time he, he was like in your head and then when he felt like he, like he couldn't get in there. Yeah, no, it's exactly that. I, the first time he was like a, he had an aura to him, you know, like it, it wasn't like, I was fighting more than Connor. I was fighting the company, the fans, the critics, you know, just all this noise. And then when I, the, the second time out in Abu Dhabi, it was just like I was fighting another man, you know? Mm. And, and so it sounds like the, the way you described the first fight, it sounds like the dichotomy of control, like the stoicism stuff hadn't yet set in. No, it was, no, like, was far from it. Were, yeah, you were still being pulled by, by those, those, those forces. Yeah, big time, man, for sure. Interesting. And I still have to fight those 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 feelings and, and things that my mind wants to go to and build up to these fights. You know, uh, like mm -hmm. I said, this is still personal to me. Yeah, totally. Uh, before we log off, I, I want to show you something. Check this out. The, the BMF belt <laughs> is right here in Montreal. <laughs> so, uh, it's crazy what happened. I remember the first time the BMF belt uh, was on the line. I was watching the pay-per-view. I may or may not have been inebriated. And the UFC says, you can buy a BMF belt. So I'm just like, yeah, screw it. I'm buying it. So, so I just purchased it on the spot. I totally <laughs> forgot about it. <laughs> Seven months later, I get this package, this heavy package. I'm like, what is this? I open it up. I see the BMF belt. I'm like, what is this? This is silly. So it happens to be in my studio. And I, I didn't know when we, we scheduled this interview, I, it wasn't announced yet that you were going to fight for the BMF belt. But for people who don't know, uh, your fight with Justin Gaethje, it's only the second BMF uh, fight ever. And for non-fans, it, it, it's reserved for the absolute most fan-friendly fights that you can imagine. The, the ones with absolute warriors that everybody loves and that really symbolize kind of like this warrior never say die mentality and a lot of it is a testament not only to you but also to your amazing opponent justin Gaethje, sure. who embodies a lot of the same qualities i find that, that you embody obviously this is a big massive fight you've got on july 29th um but does does this fight mean a little bit more to you because of this belt right here the bmf belt because that's on the line that's fun for sure. Like I would love to put that in my, you know, in my living room next to the other belts that I have. And it's a piece of history and another, you know, accolade, right? But mm. like you said, if there was ever a time to pull the, a BMF title out with what Justin's, you know, past it, it has, has shown is just incredible fights. Same as, as me, you know, we fought in a fight of the year contender back in 2018. So this is a rematch. And we're yeah. two of the top guys in the, in the lightweight division. And, and the fans know, you know, what, what they're getting into with this fight, what they're going to be buying the pay-per-view for. They know what it is. So having this BMF on top of that, it's just, it makes it fun to me. That's really cool. And are you approaching it a little bit different? Do you think like Justin's got this uh, very reckless approach sometimes, and sometimes he kind of dials it back and he's a little bit safer. And he seems to be a little bit um, harder to beat when he's a little bit safer. Are you preparing for the same fighter or are you just... Uh, preparing for 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 any possibility with him I, I, I always prepare for everything but he he's he's more technical now he's moving his feet better he's using his jab better he's uh um, getting better with his defense you know we fought five years ago so we're both completely different fighters now and his last few performances especially his last one you know he he, he fought a lot smarter than he usually does 
but I think at, at his core, he's still that that reckless guy who wants to brawl, and and we'll find out July 29th. So I, I guess the plan is to put him under some adversity and get that 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 dog out, and then kind of get him into that, that mode where you beat him the first time. <laughs> that's always the plan. That's always the plan. <laughs> adversity. Love it. Thank you so much, Dustin. This was great. I really appreciate it. Good luck at UFC 291, the BMF belt, and good luck with the Good Fight Foundation. Thank you so much, man. I'm going to get that strap, and then maybe one day if I'm, in, if I'm out in Canada, I can sign yours. If, if you're in Montreal, you've got to hit me up. You've got to sign mine, and then, then it'll make it real a little bit because I feel ridiculous right now with this thing. But i got to hey, win it here. first. i got to win <laughs> it first. you got to win it first. <laughs> exactly. All right. Thank you so much, man. Really appreciate it. Thank you, brother. All right. Take care.